Greetings and blessings. My name is Tom Lelio, and this is Lumen Gentium, the dogmatic constitution on the church. And today, we're not just going to be talking about Lumen Gentium or about the constitution, but we're actually going to be diving into the text itself and reading what the church has to say about her nature and her mission. This is the text that we're going to be using, the Vatican Collection, Vatican Council II, Volume 1, the conciliar and post-conciliar documents. And so if you want to read along or if you want to read more of the documents and actually read the document in its entirety, I would highly recommend this text to do so. The very first sentence, Christ is the light of humanity. And this is where the document gets its name from, Lumen Gentium light of humanity. So Christ is the light of humanity. So from the very beginning, the Council Fathers are talking about, hey, this is not about us. This is about Christ. And we're going to see what Christ has to say about the church that he established. Continuing on, since the church in Christ is in the nature of a sacrament, a sign and instrument, the church proposes to set forth her own nature and universal mission. This is what Lumen Gentium is about. It's about the church talking about what is our nature, what is our mission, and how do we find that in Christ. The conditions of the modern world lends greater urgency to this duty of the church. For while men of the present day are drawn ever more closely together by social, technical, and cultural bonds, it will remain for them to achieve full unity in Christ. And so the fathers are recognizing that you know, we're coming together as a, as a world society in a powerful way today through television, through media, through technology. And, and that's bringing us all together, but that's only going to take us so far. In order to achieve full unity, we need to find our common union in Christ. So let's talk about the mystery of the church. Where do we get this mystery from? Well, it comes from the Trinity. The Council Fathers are quick to point out that the only way we can understand our union as church is if we understand the union between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, in paragraph 2, they point out, The Eternal Father chooses to raise up men to share in His own divine life. He determined to call together in a holy church those who would believe in Christ. So, the church is in the plan of the Father from the very beginning. And so, if we're to understand this, we need to go to God and see what does He have in store for us. I think it's really interesting um, because we see how Christ establishes church as, as the document continues. The mystery of the church is inaugurated through Christ's words, actions, and miracles, but is principally through the person of Christ that the kingdom is revealed. So the Father has the plan. Christ inaugurates the plan. And this is what I find really interesting. You see, Christ didn't give us a Bible, right? He didn't give us the Bible as an instruction manual. He, he gave us a church. He, he called people from around him, and he established his church on St. Peter and empowered the Twelve. And that's how the church begins. God doesn't give us the Bible, so to speak. He gave us the church first. And it's through his inspiration of the Holy Spirit that the church is able to discern the sacred scriptures. And so it continues to talk about in paragraph 4, the Holy Spirit was sent in order that he might continually sanctify the church. So the Father has a plan, Christ inaugurates that plan, and the Spirit sanctifies it. Hence, the universal church is seen to be a people brought into unity from the unity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So let's talk about this unity for a second. The love of the Father for the Son is poured out. The Son receives that love and pours it back out to the Father. And the love between the Father and the Son is so powerful. It is so dynamic. It is so real that it's given its own name. It becomes or it is a, a being in and of itself. That is the Holy Spirit. And so this union of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, this common union among the Trinity, becomes a holy communion. And if the church is to be the church of Christ, we must have a holy communion between the faithful and between the faithful and the Trinity itself. 
This is key. Continuing on about the mystery of the church, we get into one of those sections that is really a buzz quote section from Lumen Gentium, and that is paragraph number eight. This is the sole church of Christ we profess to be one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. This is the sole church of Christ. It's not the church of St. Peter. It's not the church of St. Paul. This is the church of Jesus Christ. And so, the fathers point out, the church of Christ, constituted and organized as a society in the present world, subsists in the Catholic Church. Nevertheless, many elements of sanctification and of truth are found outside its visible confines. Since these are gifts belonging to the Church of Christ, they are forces impelling towards Catholic unity. So if we break that down, it basically says the Church of Christ subsists in the Church. Nevertheless, there may be elements of sanctification and truth found outside of the Church. However, since these elements actually belong to the Church, these elements are calling those individuals into a communion with the Catholic Church. This idea of subsistence comes from the Latin term substantia, which means being or essence. And so what's going on here is the Church is saying that the Church of Christ has its essence in the Catholic Church. That the Catholic Church is the main way in which the fullness of the Church of Christ is experienced here on earth today. And so, in order to get to heaven, we're, we have this one road. It's not a multiple of all roads lead to heaven, but we have this one road, which is the Church of Christ. And the fullness of the Church of Christ is found in the Catholic Church, okay? Now, other denominations, other worldviews may participate in the Church of Christ, and insofar as they participate in that, they are actually participating in the Catholic Church. They are actually uh, being drawn into union through the Catholic Church. But obviously, other denominations, other worldviews would veer off of, of, of that participation at some point in time. But this is huge. The idea of the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church, finds its fullness in the Catholic Church. Now we're going to talk about the people of God. So we talked about what is the mystery, what is the nature of the church, and what is her mission. Now we're going to talk about the people of God in a general sense. Paragraph 9. God has willed to make men holy and save them, not as individuals without any bond or link between them, but rather to make them into a people. And so what's really important here is this idea of, you know, a lot of people talk about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's all well and good if by personal relationship you mean Christ and I are, are so in union that we have a personal relationship. It's a person to a person, okay? Um, but that is misleading if we think a personal relationship means just me and Jesus and nobody else, just me and Jesus. That is not, um, that's really a misnomer because there's no such thing, right? In paragraph 9, we're talking about that God wants to make men holy, not as individuals, but rather to make them into a people. Isn't it the case that the only way we know about Christianity and about God is through other people? Isn't it the case that in order to know Christ, we need the sacraments which come from the priest, right? Isn't it true that even to know about God in Scripture, we need to rely on other people? That it was, other, that it was um, sacredly inspired or divinely inspired authors, other human beings, that wrote Scripture, so to say I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, if, that, if by that you mean it's just me and Jesus, I, don't, I, I would challenge that a little bit because the truth of the matter is God wants to bring us into a people, a, a communion of love of people. And in order to have anything like love, in order, to, in order to have anything like unity, we need to have more than just me and Jesus. Continuing on, all of those who in faith look towards Jesus God has gathered to together and established as the church, that it may be the visible sacrament of saving unity, destined to extend to all regions of the earth. It enters into human history, though it transcends at once all times and racial boundaries. This is huge. So God basically set up the church so that everyone who looks at Jesus would know where to go. God makes it really easy for us. He's like, okay, so you're going to need Jesus, 
And so you know exactly where you need to go to, to find Jesus. I'm going to establish the church so that it is the visible sacrament of saving unity so that all might look to the church and be like, that's where I need to go. And this church would transcend all times and all racial boundaries. So as the document continues, we're going to talk about the people of God more specifically. That was the general sense, but now we're going to talk about specifically what does it mean to be the people of God. And as many of you know, when we are baptized, we are given a threefold anointing, priest, prophet, and king. And so first, we're going to talk about the people of God as priest. What does it mean to be priest? Paragraph 10, Christ made the new people a kingdom of priests. The baptized are consecrated to be a spiritual house and a holy priesthood that through all the works of Christian men, they may offer spiritual sacrifices. So what is this spiritual sacrifice? Well, I look at St. Paul in his letter to the Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I urge you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, your spiritual worship. Paul is calling us to offer our entire lives to Christ as a living sacrifice. This is interesting. How many sacrifices do you know that are living? Most sacrifices that I've ever heard of are dead. That's why they're sacrifices. But Paul is calling us to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. I look again to his letter to the Galatians when he says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, insofar as I live by the faith of the Son of Man who has loved me and given himself up for me. So we're called to offer spiritual sacrifices in and through Christ, allowing Christ as the high priest to work in us to offer a pleasing sacrifice to our God. Though they differed essentially and not only in degree, the common priesthood of the faithful and the ministerial or hierarchical priesthood are nonetheless ordered to one another. Each in its own proper way shares in the one priesthood of Christ. And so if you've heard me talk about Sacrosanctum Concilium, which is another constitution from the Second Vatican Council, it talks about the liturgy. And in the liturgy, it is the exercise of the priesthood of Christ baptismally and ministerially. So here we find that it's all about the one priesthood of Christ. But there is a difference between the baptized priesthood and the ministerial priesthood. The ministerial priesthood is basically priests. You know, when we think of priests, that's the ministerial priesthood. By, by the sacrament of holy orders, they have a ministry, a ministerial priesthood that they share with Christ. And so what's interesting here is Lumen Gentium is pointing out there is a difference between the baptized and the ministerial priesthood. However, they are nonetheless ordered to one another. So how do they exercise their different roles? Well, the ministerial priest, by the sacred power that he has, forms and rules the priestly people. In the person of Christ, he affects the Eucharistic sacrifice and offers it up to God in the name of all the people. The faithful, indeed by virtue of their royal priesthood, participate in the offering of the Eucharist. They exercise that priesthood too by the reception of the sacraments, prayer and thanksgiving, the witness of a holy life, abnegation and active charity. And so the priest offers the sacrifice. Without the ministerial priesthood, there is no sacraments, okay? And so the faithful, for their part, receive the grace of the sacraments and they go out and they live the, the Christian life through active charity, through prayer, through thanksgiving, and, and, and they are the witnesses to the world. And so this is how they work. This is how they work hand in hand together. The priests kind of bring down the power from heaven and the people receive that power and they go out and they share it with the rest of the world. Let's talk about the people of God as prophets. So what is a prophet? Well, basically, a prophet is someone who, who uh, goes before the Lord to prepare his way, someone who announces the good news of God to those around them. And so we are called to be prophets. But let us remember that 
prophets aren't always welcome in their own in their own house or in their own town as Jesus points out paragraph 12 the holy people of God shares also in Christ's prophetic office it spreads abroad a living witness to him the whole body of the faithful who have an anointing that come from the Holy One cannot err in matters of belief. Now this is another one of those buzz quote sections because here the church is saying that the whole body of the faithful cannot err in matters of belief. So what does that mean? Does that mean I can believe whatever I want and I'm not committing an error? Well, let's look at it. This characteristic is shown in the supernatural appreciation of the faith, the census fide of the whole people, when from the bishops to the last of the faithful, they manifest a universal consent in matters of faith and morals. Basically, it's this idea of a supernatural consent of what is right and what is wrong with regards to faith and morals. That from the bishop to the smallest of the people in the church, there's this supernatural union of, hey, this is what is the right thing to do with regards to faith and morals. The people of God as kings. Paragraph 13. The one people of God is a, of a kingdom whose nature is not earthly, but heavenly. I think this is so key. Recognizing that the nature of the church is not earthly. It's heavenly. It's heaven bound. We are looking to the heavenly Jerusalem as a church. Since the kingdom of Christ is not of this world, the church for the people of God does not take away anything from the temporal welfare of any people. Rather, she fosters and takes to herself, insofar as they are good, the abilities, the resources, and customs of the people. In so taking them to herself, she purifies, strengthens, and elevates them. Again, pointing out that what the church sees in the, in the, in the earthly world, she, she, she takes to herself purifies it, strengthens it, and elevates it. We need not have fear that by offering our temporal gifts to the church that any violence would be done to them. It's kind of like the idea of how the church takes things, of the, uh, things outside of her and puts them into the liturgy. We are the church of bells and smells, and so we will use incense, we will use uh, bells, we will use music, all things that are very earthly, but she elevates them. She, she brings them to the next level. And so this is what we're pointing out as the people of God, as kings. It is a universal kingdom that is called to transcend this world. All men are called to this Catholic unity, which prefigures and promotes universal peace. The one thing about peace is you have to have something in union. And here we have the church, which is the plan of God, inaugurated by Christ, sanctified by the Holy Spirit, that is the precursor to this universal peace. So as I mentioned earlier, when we talked about the buzz quote of subsistence, that the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church, the question comes up, well, what does that mean for other people? Here we go, paragraph 14, to Catholics. The Church is necessary for salvation. The one Christ is mediator and the way of salvation. He is present to us in his body, which is the Church. Hence. They could not be saved who, knowing that the Catholic Church was founded as necessary by God through Christ, would refuse to enter it or to remain in it. So, if you know in your heart and in your mind that the Catholic Church is the Church of Christ, but you reject that, then by that decision you are rejecting the salvation that Christ offers us through the church. And so we need to pray carefully about this. If we know in our heart that the church is the church of Christ and we knowingly reject that, then we're going to have to stand before God and account for that. And that, that's, just, that's what they're pointing out here in paragraph 14. But it continues and talks about, what about non-Catholics? Two Christians. These Christians are indeed in some real way joined to us in the Holy Spirit. For by His gifts and graces, His sanctifying power is also active in them, and He has strengthened some of them, even to the shedding of their blood. Again, we recognize that the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church, and nevertheless, sanctification and truth may be found in elements 
outside of it. So um, non-Catholic denominations would have kernels of truth and sanctification found in them. An example of this is how the Catholic Church recognizes some Christian forms of baptism. However, they are not experiencing the fullness of the truth of Christ that is found in the church. Well, what about Jewish people or Muslim people or even those who don't believe? Paragraph 16, those who through no fault of their own do not know the gospel of Christ or his church, but who nevertheless seek God with a sincere heart and moved by grace, try in their actions to do his will as they know it through the dictates of their conscience. Those two may achieve eternal salvation. And so that, again, the church is recognizing that not everybody understands or has been made aware of the fullness of the church of Christ present in the Catholic church. And so if they are unaware through no fault of their own, Christ sees into their hearts. And it even talks about how they are still moved by grace, that the Holy Spirit still moves them to achieve good works. So too for them, salvation is attainable. Now let's talk about the church is hierarchical. And this is something that, you know, a lot of people look at it like, yeah, I know the church is hierarchical. Well, this is the goodness of the church as a hierarchy. Because, frankly speaking, this is how Christ founded it. Paragraph 20. The Sacred Synod consequently teaches that the bishops have by divine institution taken the place of the apostles. Whoever listens to them is listening to Christ, and whoever despises them despises Christ and him who sent Christ. <clears throat> and so it's really important to check out this section of Lumen Gentium that we're kind of giving an overview. But the church goes through how scripturally speaking and um, according to the way that Christ instituted the church, that the bishops were instituted by the apostles who were instituted by Christ. And so it, it, it lays it all out. So it's really important that you check out these sections, even though we just kind of hit the highlights. Paragraph 21, Episcopal consecration confers, together with the office of sanctifying, the duty also of teaching and ruling, which, however, of their very nature can be exercised only hierarchical communion with the head and members of the college. Basically what this say, is saying is the bishop's main job is sanctifying through the sacraments and teaching and ruling. That's what the bishops are here for, to kind of make sure everything's organized, but also to teach the truths of the faith. <clears throat> Paragraph 22. The Roman pontiff, Peter's successor, and the bishops are related with and united to one another. The question comes up a lot of the time, well, how does the bishop and the pope relate to one another? How, what is the deal with that? And as the, the council is pointing out here, they are related. This college, insofar as, as it is composed of many, express the, the, the variety and universality of the people of God. But insofar as it is assembled under one head, it expresses the unity of the flock in Christ. And so here we have a glimpse that the church is not either universal or just, you know, united or like Roman, what some people will say, but rather it's both and, okay? It's only in and through the bishops that the universality and the, uh, the variety of the expressions of worship in the church can, can, uh, can be expressed in, in, in among the, the church. But it's only in and through the Pope that they are brought together as one sheepfold with one shepherd. But the college or body of bishops has no authority unless it is understood together with the Roman pontiff, the successor of Peter as its head, the Pope's power of primacy overall both pastors and the faithful, remains whole and intact. In virtue of his office, that is, as vicar of Christ and pastor of the whole church, the Roman pontiff has full, supreme, and universal power over the church. Again, I cannot stress how important it is to read these paragraphs in the context of Lumen Gentium itself. So please go to the text to find out more information or if you have any questions with regards to this. And so what's going on here 
is that we want to make sure that we recognize the authority of the Pope, okay? That he's not just some guy uh, just sitting out there, um, but he, he has authority in the church and that Christ and the Holy Spirit and God are moving in and through him so that when he speaks in matters of faith and morals, uh, there is an authority there. So moving on from there, we're going to talk about papal infallibility. What does it mean for the Pope to be infallible? Infallibility is a special exercise of the Supreme Shepherd, the Roman Pontiff, under the following conditions. One, by a definitive act, he proclaims a doctrine of faith and morals. Two, he speaks as head of the church, ex cathedra, or from the seat. Three, he defines doctrine of faith and morals issuing from the deposit of revelation. The infallibility promised to the church resides also in the body of bishops when that body exercised the supreme magisterium with the successor of Peter. And so basically what it comes down to is papal infallibility applies to the Pope pronouncing truths with regards to faith and morals. With regards to faith and morals as they are divinely revealed to us. Let's talk about the laity. What is the role of the, the laity in the church? Paragraph 31. The term laity is here understood to mean all the faithful except those in holy orders and those who belong to a religious state approved by the church. So who is a laity? It's us guys. And what are we supposed to do? Well, it belongs to the laity to seek the kingdom of God by engaging in temporal affairs and directing them according to God's will. So basically, we need to just go out into our world, into our daily world, and direct them according to God's word. And someone who really knew a lot about this was St. Francis de Sales. And I really encourage you to check out his work, Introduction to the Devout Life. He believed that perfection and holiness wasn't just for the monk who got up every day, day after day, just, and just prayed. But he believed that everyone was called to that universal uh, call to holiness. And so he put together a work on how to encourage the laity to become holy. Continuing on, there they are called by God that they may contribute to the sanctification of the world as from within, like leaven, by fulfilling their own particular duties. So if you're a baker, well, God has called you to be a baker and you should be the best baker that you could possibly be. If you are a teacher, you are entrusted with the, with, the, with the sanctification and salvation of those students' souls in some very real way. That doesn't mean that as a math teacher you go on raving about the Bible instead of teaching mathematics, but rather maybe you might do something like show the students how wonderful and awesome mathematics are and how they really reveal the beauty of God. If you are a, a wife and a mother who just stays at home with your children, that is so important because it is in and through that particular duty as, as, husband, or as wife and as mother um, that you really reach to your children and you, you care for their souls, not just for their temporal needs. This is the job of the laity, and it's a huge job. And the only way that we can do it is through the grace of God. And that's why we need the ministerial priesthood to allow us access to the sacraments where we receive His grace. The laity are given the special vocation to make the church present in those places and circumstances where only them can it become the salt of the earth. Again, priests can't, you know, go and, and, and become, uh, you know, let's say waste management workers. They can't become garbage men, right? So even the garbage men are called to, to make the church of Christ present in the real world. The laity become powerful heralds of the faith in things hoped for. This evangelization acquires a specific property and peculiar efficacy because it is accomplished in the ordinary circumstances of the world. Married and family life have a special importance. Married partners must, witness, must be witnesses of faith and love of Christ to one another and to their children. The Christian family proclaims aloud both the present power of the kingdom of God and the hope of the blessed life. Hence, by example and by their testimony, they convict the world of sin and give light to those who seek truth. And so they're just basically giving a little shout out uh, to the married and family life. But again, 
For more on this, you need to check out the text itself. So we're going to move on to the call to holiness. Like I said before, that call of holiness is not just for the priest who can do all his prayers in one day, but also to the laity. So what is this call to holiness? Paragraph 39. This holiness of the church is constantly shown forth in the fruits of grace which the Spirit produces in the faithful. The faithful must therefore hold on to and perfect in their lives that sanctification which they have received from God. It is therefore quite clear that all Christians in any state or walk of life are called to the fullness of Christian life, into the perfection of love, and by this holiness a more human manner of life is fostered also in the earthly society. That this universal call for holiness is not just for the church, to make the church a better place, but by this universal call to holiness, the entire world might be a better place. And that's a powerful statement, you know, because it's only in and through us living this universal call to holiness that we begin to have an impact, not just on our lives and on our church's life, but on the life of the whole world. Constitution goes on to talk about the religious life and how unique and special and what a gift it is to the life of the church. Members of these religious families enjoy many helps towards holiness of life. They have a stable and more solidly way, based way of the Christian life. They receive well-proven teaching on seeking after perfection. They are bound together in brotherly communion in the army of Christ. And so it starts off by talking about, hey, this is why the religious life is sweet, right? They get a stable, you know, a scheduled based way of life. So it's like, okay, this is our way of life and this is how we roll. This is how we follow after Christ. Then, not only that, but they are receiving well-proven teachings from amazing saints like St. Francis of Assisi or St. Benedict or St. Dominic. You know, all these people um, are, are, are being, they're, they're pouring into uh, those who are in the religious life. And then they are bound together in communion that their community life is like, hey, we're all here to seek after Christ. And this is what enables them to press in, press into that life of holiness. It should be seen as a form of life to which some Christians are called by God so that they may enjoy a special gift of grace in the life of the church and may contribute each in his own way to the saving mission of the church. Again, religious life is awesome, and if you're called to it, not only will you receive much, but so too will the universal church. It goes on. Religious are called to be instruments of love because the religious life reveals more clearly to all believers the heavenly goods which are already present in this age. Do you ever watch, you know, a sister or a nun just enjoying life, just enjoying the goodness of the life here today? Well, that's what it's talking about. They are living witnesses and instruments of love through that. The religious state constitutes a closer imitation and abiding reenactment in the church of the form of life which the Son of God made his own when he came into the world. We look at priests who give up everything, their entire lives to the service of others, we see Christ and how Christ gave up everything for others. Religious life, this state manifested in a special way the transcendence of the kingdom of God and its requirements over all earthly things and the highest kinds of bonds within. When we see religious, I, at least when I see religious, I just seem like, wow, that is so beautiful. They're, and it's like looking into heaven, seeing like, how happy, how awesome, how just blessed we will be when we, when we come into the kingdom because I see that reflection in so many religious people and I just want to thank them from the bottom of my heart for being that witness to the world. The, be the document continues on to talk about the pilgrim church. Let's talk about the pilgrim church. Paragraph 48. The church will perceive its perfection only in the glory of heaven. And so the church is great and all, but we're only going to see that perfection of the church in heaven. At the present time, some of his disciples are pilgrims on earth. Others have died and are being purified, and still others are in glory, contemplating in full light God himself, triune and one, exactly as he is. 
All of us, however, in varying degrees and in different ways, share in the same charity towards God and our neighbors, and we all sing of Him our glory, the glory of God. It's talking about this idea that the church is still on its way to heaven, that we shouldn't get too comfortable, right? We should always be longing for the glory of God in heaven. So paragraph 51, let us teach the faithful, therefore, that the authentic cult of the saints does not consist so much in any multiplicity of external acts, but rather in a more intense practice of love, whereby for our own greater good and that of the church, we seek from the saints example in their way of life, fellowship in their communion, and the help of their intercession. It's talking about that while we are pilgrims here on earth, we have saints who have gone before us and we can seek after their help. Again, check out this section on the Pilgrim Church. It is beautiful. It is absolutely wonderful. The final chapter of Lumen Gentium talks about Our Lady, and this is beautiful, that the Council Fathers would, in, you know, it's got to be the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, would, would close this document on the church with Mary. You know, a lot of people talk about the Catholic Church that are like anti-women or they, they don't really like women very much. And you could probably get that out of the document. You know, when you look at it, I'm talking about the hierarchy, the priesthood, the bishops, the pope, yada, yada, yada. Um, well, here we have an entire section dedicated to Mary because the church sees her as the preeminent figure of the church. And you need to read this section because it goes throughout Scripture and talks about how, you know, even in Genesis, we see Mary as a prefigurement of the church. And at the end of the, the scriptures, in the book of Revelation, we see the woman that is clothed with the sun um, as another figure of the church. So please read this section in its entirety when you get a chance. Paragraph 53. She is hailed as the preeminent and as wholly unique member of the church and as its right and outstanding model of faith and charity. The Catholic Church taught by the Holy Spirit honors her with filial affection and devotion as most beloved mother. Mary's function as mother of men in no way obscures or diminishes the unique mediation of Christ, but rather shows its power. In a wholly singular way, she cooperated by her obedience, faith, hope, and burning charity in the works of the Savior in restoring supernatural life to souls. For this reason, she is a mother to us in the order of grace. Let the faithful remember, moreover, that your devotion consists neither in sterile nor transitory affection, nor any certain vain credulity, but produces from true faith, by which we are led to recognize the excellence of the mother of God, and we are moved to a filial love towards our mother and to the imitation of her virtues." Basically, just this overview talks about how Mary doesn't take anything away from Christ, but rather Mary is an example that we can follow after as church, and that by following Mary's example, we might come to understand the nature of the church as really one about service, right? It is Mary who begins, you know, in her heart, the church, when she says, be it done to me according to your word. Right? It is Mary who is present at the cross when the church is, is, um, is, is being birthed through the blood and the water from Christ's side. It is Mary who is present at Pentecost, at the beginning of the descent of the Holy Spirit sanctifying the church. And so we look to Mary as our mother, as our model of what it means to be church. I want to thank you guys so much for taking some time to learn a little bit about Lumen Gentium. Um, I'm hopefully going to be putting together a couple more of these videos, but let me know what you think. Subscribe to the channel, comment below, and just let me know what are you looking for in this year of faith to learn more about the documents of the Second Vatican Council. I'm Tom Lelio. God bless.